on tap today we have jeffrey wiseman how are you doing today good sir i was kidding sorry yes ah here i am ah glad to have you on board i've gotten to know your work obviously i'm a huge back to the future fan so that's where i kind of came into the picture but you've done a lot of really cool stuff um and what really made me want to reach out to you was the fact that you've done a lot of work in live theater as well and that seems to be where you found your your true uh, talent so to speak uh and, and i like the fact that you got to have so many experiences you got to have so many talents and then immediately reached out to teach other people too so there's a lot there i'd like to get into yeah that's there there is a lot there i uh thank you very much for um reaching out just curious how you came up with the trilobite thing but uh yeah it's, is that because there's a lot of fingers and i don't know well the trilobite because trilobites are extinct they're fossils i'm not a spring chicken myself um, a lot of people who do podcasts are just getting out and I, I respect that but it's like i people who have been around for a while have a perspective and we want to have a conversation with the younger crowd too so I, I think there's there's a value in having a little couple of years of experience on you okay but we're not the hungry a, part comes from the fact that we're we're hungry we're we're hungry for experience we're um perspective great and uh yes i so many uh, things to to mention. Uh, I'm example have my hair long right now, uh, playing in a, a live immersive show uh, set in Victorian London, and uh, I, as you said, you know, kind of got my start in in doing theater mostly in school and community theater uh, because my folks didn't really want me to get into uh, Hollywood show business. Uh, they they knew a lot of working actors who he they thought were suffering or who who they thought you know who in fact gave them advice for me not even to not pursue it because it it was a real struggle very hard living uh, but it's in my it's in my system so I had to do it so I did a lot of shows in junior high and high school and community theater and I uh, got pulled into doing shows at UCLA when I was a kid playing Joyce DeWitt's son and stop the world I want to get off and uh, and I even did a thousand clowns you know and well I was just uh, thrilled even though I was the kid on the block to get on some uh, big projects on stage and then I would find myself attracted to whenever I'd see something shooting in my neighborhood growing up. An episode of the FBI, I remember, was shooting in about 1968 in my neighborhood in Play Del Rey and went and introduced, immediately recognized the main guest star, Monty Markham, from his show, The Second Hundred Years, that I was a fan of. And he liked that, that this kid, I think I was in fourth or fifth grade, recognized him. And I remember uh, a character actor noticed that I had my report card it must have been graduation from fourth or fifth grade. And he went down my report card with me and said, hey, like the A in English and the B in history, what's this D in math? Kid, how are you going to know if your agent's screwing you or not? You want to be an actor? You got to do better in math. Uh, I, I, I always had um, really great luck. I heard when I was in, uh, a, when I was in my freshman or sophomore year in high school, that Mel Brooks was shooting something in the neighborhood and walked home instead of taking the bus home. And sure enough, started seeing people walking around the Santa Monica promenade in Victorian evening wear. I, oh, it must be happening around here somewhere. I think I was 14. A, a large gentleman in his evening dress had his mustache kind of falling off, flapping. And I said, excuse me, sir, your mustache. And he said, oh, thank you. Who are you? I said, well, I'm an actor. He goes, oh, yeah, what have you done? And I started listing off the shows I'd done in, in school, some Shakespeare and contemporary shows and so on and so forth. And he said, really, you're an actor. Is that You want to meet Mel? I said, yes. Mel Brooke, yes. He said, come with me. And he took me to the set, uh, at the Mayfair, Mayfair Music Hall, where they were shooting the putting on the Ritz number. And the first actor I saw was Marty Feldman in street clothes, and he was wearing a man bag, which... I wear a man back now and uh, 
and uh, Peter Boyle was there as the creature done up in this beautiful green makeup. I said, this is going to look great. And then when it came out in black and white, I was like, oh, no. Anyway, uh, I became friends with this, this gentleman who was a kind of a professional extra. And he took me in to uh, meet Mel. And, and I says, Mel, you want to meet this kid? He does acting. And, says, and Mel's running by, by and said, I've got no time for kids. You know, and went on his way to direct. But it was, it was very cool to uh, make friends with this gentleman. Roy was his name. And he started uh, giving me a call from time to time and would take me on to sets. He was working on a medical center. I went on the medical center set and just hung out for the day at 20th Century Fox. It was so cool <laughs> playing around on the sets on the soundstage. He took me up to Will Gear's Theatricum Botanicum and, and met Will Gear and his family, who I later worked with doing Shakespeare. And as soon as I was out of high school, uh, even though my parents did not want me to get into acting, they saw that I, I wanted to and they were going to keep me now from doing it. And I signed up to be. Uh, just to get on studio lots and then uh, onto sound stages, I signed up to be a background actor and worked on films like uh, FM and The Rose and Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and, and uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand. And ultimately saw that, that it was really not fulfilling for an actor or a storyteller to kind of wait around all day playing backgammon until you're called on to walk through or do a little bit of business. But uh, I got, I got a little bit more active activity action on uh, Sergeant Pepper's in the scene where I get with a bunch of other people uh, brainwashed by Alice Cooper doing these dance moves. And, but st still, it, it wasn't rewarding. And I got advice from the artistic director at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, who I had auditioned for, I think it was Brighton Beach Memoirs. I had a callback. And... Uh, he said, you know, you've got talent, but no one's going to take you seriously unless you get some really good training on your resume. And I uh, set my sights to go to the American Conservatory Theater, where I studied. And uh, for my intermediate year of, towards my MFA, I uh, went to San Francisco State. And while going to San Francisco State, I saw a notice that a, a Hollywood production company was having an open call. And I found myself at this open call and uh, actually landed a screen test for a film that was originally called The Genius. And uh, it had Warren notes attached at the time and then he died. And I know they had at one time were pursuing John Lennon and he was, uh, he left <laughs> while they're in trying to get this film off the ground. And it went into turnaround where a film loses its backing, United Artists and MGM execs had it kind of butted heads over not whether or not they're going to do this film uh but it eventually got back on track and renamed war games and i screen tested uh with ali cd the same day that uh, about five other guys who came in through their agents not through the open calls that they had done in five cities uh and uh dana carvey and eric stoltz and uh, a host of really great talented guys all tested that day and none of us got it. Of course, it went to Matthew Broderick. And the director who had told my agent, my future agent, that I was his favorite for the role, uh, had got, got fired, in fact, a couple of weeks into shooting uh, Martin Brest. And then uh, John Badham stepped in to finish that. But anyway, nonetheless, I got a, a really good agent out of that. And even though I had fallen in love with San Francisco Bay Area, I had to move back to L.A. to be available to go on calls for this agent. And pretty much launched my theatrical film career uh, about three months later, co-starring in George Miller's segment, uh, remake of Nightmare at 20,000 Feet with John Lithgow uh, for the Twilight Zone movie. And that by itself was an amazing production. I mean, it, the, the Twilight Zone is, is one of those things that, that it, it rewrote the way we look at the bizarre fiction for the the adult audience it, it, and and to, to try to bring it back every couple of years i loved seeing how we put a new spin on that so that was a really great place to get get started i think and and uh, you know looking at uh, rod serling's what he was trying to do he was trying to do morality plays he was he was uh very conscious of the human condition and wanted to in influence people 
uh, and and have little morality tales. And the only way he could do it really without getting flack was by setting it into a science fiction uh, genre. And, and there are so many great stories that deal with greed or hubris or, you know, this and that. And then, and it really was fantastic to uh, grow up loving the, that series. And then to be able to work with, first of all, George Miller, who I was a huge fan of uh, Mad Max and Road Warrior. And this was his first Hollywood film. And then I was a big fan of John Lithgow uh, from GARP and uh, knowing of his stage work and such. And then, uh, hitting it off with Donna Dixon very well. And the whole cast was like an ensemble. It was really a thrill to be on that set. And then watching Alan Davio, the cinematographer, uh, really just overjoyed at the the setup he had because it was one of the first times they were able to put a, a tap on the lens and have video playback. They could actually see, or a monitor, so they could see uh, or George could see what the camera was seeing. And uh, I remember him being beh beside himself with that. And then we, on top of it, we had Garrett Brown with his newfangled Steadicam working, running up and down the aisles with the 65 pound Steadicam, you know, getting those action shots. It was really a thrill to be on that set. I was personally shocked when Spielberg decided to complete the movie after the terrible, three months after the terrible action and on Landis's segment with the horrible loss of the children and, and Vic Morrow. And I thought it was in bad taste, but then, you know, I didn't have much choice because I wanted, it was my first co-star offering, offering a, a, for film work and to work with a lot of really wonderful people. So it was, it's, I've had that several times in my career where I needed to weigh whether or not I should be a part of that. You know, the Back to the Future story is, is like that too. It's like, uh, I didn't, I wasn't fully informed uh, as producers are want to do to, you know, keep you in the dark for negotiations or if they're up to mischief like that production in particular. But nonetheless, uh, I started working there tw after Twilight Zone, uh, worked with, uh, with Sean Penn in a scene for a Louis Maul film called Crackers, which was a remake of an Italian comedy. And it was really great to meet Donald Sutherland. I have mutual friends and uh, was able to strike up a conversation, actually hung out for a week in San Francisco, waiting to shoot my scene on location and, and meeting Wallace Shawn and, and uh, Jack Warden. And it, it was really, you know, I just love being on set. So I would, even though I wasn't working on those days, I was part of the cast. So I hung out and watched shooting and, and love it. Just love the creative process, getting my toe in the water and and understanding how to work the camera how to hit your marks how to respect everyone cast and crew and and that communication is key it was learning all these things and at the same time the very exciting element of being uh elbow to elbow with these legends and uh, yeah, i'm sorry go ahead no go ahead i, said. I was just going to wrap up on on the louis mall film I had come to San Francisco to shoot my scene, but the weather was rainy and they kept putting me off and finally said at the end of a week, go back to LA, we'll shoot your scene down there. Uh, two or three months later, I get the call to go to Universal to shoot my scene and they're making it to make it match. It's like, well, we should have just shot it in the rain, but this is great. I get paid again. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then after the Louis Mall film, uh, I started working uh, on some television projects like, uh, what's his name, Max Headroom and uh, Dallas, uh, you know, little little bit parts, uh, and then eventually worked into some guest, guest star roles. I was just thinking when you were talking about, you know, being watching Twilight Zone growing up, and so many uh, of the actors I've talked to, who are getting into reboots. We're all about the reboots these days. And they, they talk about the experience of, of watching something and being a fan and then getting to step into the production of it years later in life and how that, that creates a lot of mixed feelings. And just thinking that that was probably a very early example of that. Well, I had that on, on Back to the Future. When in 83, before Crispin got 
the first film, I worked with him on a film with Dan O'Herlihy at the American Film Institute. And I thought Chrisman was a fascinating actor, got his number, tried to stay in touch. And when he, when uh, that summer, uh, I was coming out co-starring in Pale Rider with Clint Eastwood. Got to play cowboy on that film for six weeks. It was just a joy. And I wanted to see what other films were coming out that summer of 85 and Back to the Future was the big one. Big, uh, so I went and saw that and I love, of course, Michael J. Fox from his TV work. And then Chris Lloyd is a big fan of his work. Leah was fantastic. And then here comes Crispin knocking it out of the park with this incredible quirky character. And uh, I, I even called him to congratulate him. And uh, then, you know, celebrating that. And then four years later, uh, or three and a half years later, being asked to uh, be a part of that franchise was really great. And I, and once again, there was a, a, a place where they let me know that it was to be a photo double and stand in, which I was willing to do because I needed to make my medical for uh, my second son was was pretty imminent, and I needed the medical uh, to to cover expenses. And and I was. Uh, it was like in the 11th hour uh, that I was told that Crispin wasn't coming back, that I'd be playing the role. And I was like, I couldn't fathom how that, they were going to make that work. In my mind, they, they needed George in two places at, one, at the same time because they were fitting me for the, the prosthetic makeups. And, I, and when I heard he wasn't coming back, I just figured he couldn't get out of another film project. They couldn't make that work. I wasn't really privy to all the arguments over pay and control and so on and so forth until during the process of shooting stories would come out. And, uh, and I was never told that they didn't have the rights to the like his likeness, his life cast in the makeups for young George that I wore. So it was kind of icky and sticky and they didn't let me promote myself. And I felt Crispin had been done wrong as well. Anyway, I would though was thrilled to be a part of the trilogy and the fans have embraced me now whereas when the films first came out i was kind of uh thrown under the bus or and also uh not able to promote myself i actually had a very difficult time getting photos and so on and so forth from production so it was it was a mixed bag once again uh prior to that though you know i continued working on stage uh working in environmental theater and doing everything from murder mysteries to theme park work to uh, um, immersive stuff like Renaissance fairs and, and uh, Christmas fairs in Victorian England. Uh, I uh, just love acting. So I had uh, also the need to work where I could get it, uh, diversify uh, so I could pay the bills. I had a family I needed to feed and so I fell into in about 87 uh, playing uh, Stanley Laurel at um, Universal Studios in Hollywood on the tour. And a year after uh, playing a Stanley, I started putting together Charlie Chaplin. A year after that, Groucho Marx, and really worked hard at doing uh, accurate Im interpretations of them, of each one of those genius what's the multiple of geniuses genius geniuses or genius I think it's geniuses but genii that sounds like it'd be funnier yeah genii and and more recently i have a three stooges team uh where i played uh larry fine uh, and i've been playing mark twain and uh just you know like i said diversify go go to where the action is where where i can get the work the Mark Twain bit was the part that made me say, I got to reach out and talk to this guy. I got to send him an email because I, I'm a huge fan of Mark Twain's writing, obviously, you know, far too young to have ever seen him in person, but it's just. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm old enough. I probably could have seen him in person. Uh, you passed him in the hallway. Uh, <laughs> it, he just the wit about him, the, the way he, he put his perspective on the world and the way that even almost 150 years later, you can read what he says and it still makes a heck of a lot of sense. And to be able to wrap that up into a real person today. Yeah. He's, he's pretty timeless. And, and I've, uh, since the pandemic, 
have embraced trying to get off the ground a show based on his version of American history. And I found an angle now in that, whether it was the abolition of slavery, whether it was women's suffrage for the right to vote, whether it was uh, his anti anti-imperialist stance or the rights of animals, all these different uh, very timely questions or topics, he was on usually one side of the question and it was up to his life experience or one of his relatives, like his wife, beating him over the head and until he saw the light and he would go to the generally right side of a, a topic. And each segment deals with just that, with him having a character, a change of character without losing his change. He, he remained kind of a grump. He was a bit of a grumpy guy, I think, uh, but also had great joys in many, many different ways. His, his sarcasm and his humor often comes out of his grumpiness. And uh, it, it's a really fun project that I'm working with the uh, Center for Mark Twain Studies in Elmira. And I'm working with uh, various living history groups to uh, develop this, this project. So I'm very proud of that. Uh, and I fell into playing Twain a little over 10 years ago. Uh, a, a PBS film called uh, Jerusalem, Dreamland, Mark Twain in Jerusalem, which was originally called uh, Mark Twain in the Holy Land. I, I got cast and, and went to Israel and shot for 10 days and shot in LA and shot in San Francisco, playing Twain in this dramatization of his trip to the Europe and the Holy Land on the first commercial uh, cruise line, New York in 1867. So it's, it's been uh, a lot of reading my bibliography and I was over 36 books by Twain and on Twain. And uh, so I'm trying to develop that as a sustainable thing for an actor to do in his dotage. Not that I'm in my dotage, I'm, I'm a young 63. You're just getting started. Yeah. <laughs> but I, when I've, read i mean i i love travel i love the humor and i love reading mark twain's accounts of his world travels i remember there was one where he had been gone for so long he traveled europe it might have been the same trip i'm not sure but he ends up just making a list of all the american foods he really misses and can't wait to get back to eat and i can just that that just is it's such a human moment where it's like he's so thankful to be able to travel and he's like I really just want some mashed potatoes. I really want a good pot roast. It, it could have been uh, following the equator is the story of his world tour. Uh, and that is later in his life when he needed to tour to pay off some of the, his debt, his bankruptcy. You know, he, he made very poor decisions in uh, his businesses uh, several times, trying to invest too soon in a typesetting machine that he really just kept pumping money into and lost his wife's fortune and, uh, his own fortunes and and but the, that traveling the equator he saw how the british empire treated this there's <laughs> members of their kingdom in india and australia and he thought uh he really became formed his anti-imperialist stance there and really spoke out when roosevelt uh for uh, for in the, in the name of imperialism went after puerto rico and and uh cuba and and the Philippines and all that. So there was real tension between Twain and, and uh, the United States government there. So it's, there's a lot of richness in his story and, and talking about his gastronomic tendencies, he was able to eat a hundred oysters in one sitting. Sources say. I, yeah, <laughs> challenge accepted. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> I've been known to eat a few myself. You're, I, I like what you do is uh, improvisational. I do, I, I see you have a background in that, and especially with the, the characters that you're bringing out, they're also characters that have a history of, you know, quick witted comedy, slapstick comedy, improv. Uh, thinking back to, I, I had uh, a lot of people on who, are, have a background in improv as well, most notably Frank Ferrante, who does the Groucho Marx. And it's a skill that fascinates me because I have no talent for it whatsoever. I, I really 
don't think on my feet in a comedic way at all. Do you think it's an easy tactic to get into? Is it something that comes naturally? Well, it's it, once again, it's a craft. And like any craft, you have to practice. You train in it and you practice. I started very early on uh, improvising in class at school and grade school, uh, taking the theme of whatever period of history we were uh, studying and would do live broadcasts uh, for my report from that period of history. Or uh, I began doing Renaissance fairs in the uh, early to mid seventies, where you would create a character in a backstory and then improvise in the streets all day. You may have some scripted things and bits. Um, and then Commedia dell'arte, which is 800 years old now, they would take the stock characters that they knew, the relationships of the characters, what animals they were based on, what so on and so forth, the, the uh, elements of that character. And then they would form these scenarios where they would know point A, B, and C, where they had to hit, but everything in between was improvised. And I also worked out of uh, university with a, a bunch of folk after moving back to Los Angeles from San Francisco, others who'd come down and started working with the Groundlings and Second City and other groups. And we'd get together for another night of improv jam, doing a Viola Spolin games and doing Keith Johnstone narrative uh, improv. And uh, one group that I had formed came out of, I was in a large group of those jammers called the Comedy Omelette. And when that broke up, I took those who wanted to still play and formed the Flying Penguins. And then the Flying Penguins got absorbed by my friend Dan O'Connor's and uh, the late great uh, Ellen Idelson's forming of Los Angeles theater sports. Out of the ranks, uh, folk like uh, uh, Wayne Brady and, and Brad Sherwood, uh, a lot of people who really made a huge success in the improv world on television and elsewhere. And I've been very fortunate to work with great improvisers. A lot of those folk from Los Angeles theater sports now as impro do full two and hour, two hour plus shows based on Jane Austen or Tennessee Williams or Twilight Zone. Uh, and they do an entire improv show based off one suggestion. And, and it is because they've been doing it for 30 years. They've honed the craft. I luckily, when playing Stan Laurel or Charlie Chaplin or Groucho Marx, had, of course, those characters well fleshed out and a lot of resource of their lines and, and bits from their stage and, and film work. But then I'm filling an eight hour day in a theme park and I would improvise uh, with the guest. I learned how to greet in 15 diff different languages uh, because the international guests, as soon as you break the ice, with their language, they think you know how to speak to them. They open up and they and they love that. And it, and I love people and world culture. And uh, so so yes, I think it's very important. I uh, I've used improv on film sets on Twilight Zone movie. George Miller said, if in rehearsal there's a bit or a line, or come up with it. Let's try it. And I came up with uh, a half dozen bits and a half dozen lines. Not all of them made the film. But uh, wonderful in that he was a, 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 a collaborator. Are you hearing me okay? Yes, yes, I am. Good. I, I got to notice my connection may be a little unstable. I'm a little unstable. I don't know. Well, so far, so uh, good here. So on other projects, you know, some, some projects, the script is set and you have the writer often there. Uh, and if any changes are coming, they, they're going to take care of it, you know, and, and directors can be very set on what's written on the page and others, uh, they don't mind collaborating. And if you come up with something that sounds even better than what's in the script, they're happy to do that. On one project I did, I think 30% of my performance uh, was improvised and uh, it came up with some really lovely things in a, a cult film now called Corked in which I play an obsessive compulsive winemaker. And it's sort of a mockumentary on the wine world. Really fun film. Uh, another one called- a lot of fun. Uh, uh, Nobody's Laughing, in which I play a, a, a guy who's only comfortable in his skin unless he's made up as a clown. Uh, we had a happy accident where 
when walking his daughter down the aisle at her wedding, she kisses him and comes away wearing some of his clown makeup. And the, the director said, cut, no, 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 let's do it, lose the makeup thing. And, and I was like, no, that's, that's a gift from God. What we've just had, that's gold. And, and he, it, I tried for five, 10 minutes to try to talk him into keeping it. He said, all right, we're gonna do it both ways. And we shot both ways. And of course he kept the version where she comes away wearing the makeup and even added when this is the groom, the groom comes away wearing the makeup too. It's kind of like a symbolic uh, passing of love from the main character. And it works so beautifully. It was gorgeous in the final cut when they, when they kept that. The creative process. Yeah. I mean, uh, looking over the Commedia dell'arte, I hope I said that right. My I, Italian is terrible. But um, it's the, the idea of being able to we have this concept now that everything is either scripted or improv and being able to blend the two is an art form that I, I don't think we touch on enough these days. Well, the, the commedia often, the troops were often families of performers and acrobats and they, they knew each other's bits and shtick. And, and you hear that term shtick that comes from slapstick, the shtick. So if example, a scenario goes south, and someone forgets their line or doesn't do their bit or they lose the story and thing and they're looking at each other they don't know what to do they reach for their slapstick and start beating each other on the on the butt and they're not really hitting each other the slapstick has a you know it's on a hinge and and does this and when i teach comedia dell'arte the students love it i teach them how to use it without first of all you could pinch your own self in the hinge if you're not careful and you hurt someone if you're not if you're not stopping short of their butt or wherever you're hitting them with the slapstick. So it's, it's an agreed upon activity like fight choreography. It's a dance and it's joyous fun. I, I rarely see a comedia troupe that doesn't have fun uh, and, and the audience as well. I, and I've had my students just blow me away with their creative uh, discoveries. I, I put them out on, on the campus in, in uh, their outfits and masks and have them just do uh, Scenarios or Lazzi or Lazzo uh, for an hour, and and it's joyous. And the students that don't know what's going on are fascinated by what they see too. It's like any good writer will tell you that once you define a character enough, and you define what their motivations are, and you put them up against another character, it, it almost starts to resolve itself. The, the the drama starts to take place because you've done the job of setting up what that person's there for. I... Yes, if you know your character well, I had numerous uh, wonderful things happen on, on sets that I did not plan for, but I knew the character well. I knew that I needed to be open to the possibilities. If I can be moved by what a, another character is doing to me or the circumstances is doing me, uh, I'm open to it that am I, well, I'm the paintbrush and I need to be open to the possibilities. If I miss a color or an opportunity, I'll beg the director for uh, another chance. On one film, Low Budget India did a few years ago with, with Vernon George Wells, in fact, was in the, the cast. He, he was in Mad Max, uh, Road Warrior. And uh, in the scene, my character is an epileptic who's de uh, depressed to a widower who's uh, protecting a, a, an abused uh, adolescent girl who's being abused by the local gang and in the foster care system by her her foster parents her foster father is is molesting her and 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 my character is sort of like her her saving angel but because of the pressure of the character that Vernon George Wells plays and the others that play this character's friends say it doesn't look right this little girl is going to your apartment. You're going to get arrested for statutory or whatever. You're being accused. And he literally has to push her against his own heart out of his life. And when he gets his key back and, and, and sends her away uh, sort of coldly and that door shuts, I flew back. As the character, I flew back and had a grand mal seizure. And luckily, the director, who was also working the camera for that on handheld, followed me. And it's one of the more potent moments in the movie where I'm having this seizure and uh, stayed with me. It's, it wasn't in the script, but it was right. It just seemed so right. 
because he uh, went early on in the film, he has a grand mal seizure uh, in the script. And uh, it's during a lovemaking scene where he's actually fantasizing about his wife, but she's died. And, and he has a seizure while making love to this, this prostitute. It was a very heavy scene too. It was a very heavy movie called Savior of None, which I think is still streaming on Amazon. So this is uh, something I put together to show at various uh, fan cons and such. There I am as a kid doing Blythe Spirit in junior high. And, uh, you know, I couldn't, couldn't stop. Once I started working on stage, I just didn't stop. Um, this is from Twilight Zone movie. Uh, there's the cast and um, with Donna Dixon. Hey, Aaron, I, I just uh, decided to show uh, the slideshow. This is uh, from Johnny Dangerously with Michael Keaton and this from Pale Rider. I love Johnny Dangerously so much. That Stop. is, Clint? that movie is, if you haven't, if you are a fan of parody and you haven't seen it, you are doing yourself a disservice. Did you know it was originally a musical? I believe it. I didn't know that, but I believe it. They, they showed all the musical numbers at the rap party and uh, a lot of people were flat and, or it just wasn't working. I can see why they took everything but Mary Lou Henner's musical number out. Here I am as Screech's guru on Saved by the Bell, the, the high geek. God rest Dustin. Mike Mills there touching me up as the old George makeup. Mike Mills was a foreman on Beetlejuice. Ah. This is a treasure right here. How's granddad's little pumpkin came from because of the hot pants that Marlene was wearing made Michael's butt look like a pumpkin butt. This is how I break <laughs> between uh, setups. They put, they put uh, George in that ortho live apparently uh, to uh, keep Crispin on his marks. Apparently Crispin couldn't hit his marks con consistently. And that way the, the bobs controlled him or me. Uh, there's that Vistaglide uh, Panavision camera that spliced the film inside it. Yeah, if you're so Michael can play the multiple roles. And for the famous uh, spin your axis for pizza, uh, for, uh, then it was all cut, but it's in the bonus material if you want to see some more comedy that I got to do. So the bits I did, like eating a banana upside down, it was all improvised. They, it would take most of George's lines away to give them to Michael or Leah. And I was like, you guys, I can act, I can deliver a line. And here's that young George makeup that Crispin sued over. Mm -hmm. And it was really a lovely ensemble. Everyone very pro, lots of money. It, everyone made it, uh, except me, I think, made a great deal of money on that. The films are close to a billion dollars worldwide now that they've made. That's actually oh, not wow. Michael in this shot. That's Michael's photo double, Kevin. And then part three, I got to do just one day as, as middle-aged George. And then we do uh, reunions and stuff with Chris and Claudia. I have seen some of those conventions mentioned, and I would love to be at one one of these days. And this was at a DeLorean car show. And this was from the, uh, the very first uh, reunion where Michael showed up uh, unannounced. Well, Jeffrey, I'm having some bandwidth issues here, and I, I think you mentioned yours as well. So why don't we go ahead and quit while we're ahead here? Well, I, I, I kept, like to make sure I kept it going. People... I, the recording should I, still be happening. I believe it is. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we we did a chance to get we gave people a chance to the links to my Twitter and Instagram and all that good stuff. And if people want to get an autographed photo, you can email me directly from jeffreyweisman.com. I'm going to put all that in the show notes on my website, aaronbossig.com. Links to all your stuff there. Uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, if you want to see the video, uh, the pictures are on the YouTube version of the show. I really appreciate it. I'm honored to have you here, sir. 
Well, thanks for having me on, Aaron. Have a happy holiday season. And to everyone, uh, whether you're a fan or not, I'll, hopefully I'll see you in the future. All right. Thank you so much. I'll talk soon. Be well.